I want to say that's kind of how we hit it off, right, John? I think we were at the Combine, like, 2011, 2012, just BSing about music. And, you know, I was obviously a big yeah. fan of yours for years. Because it, it goes without saying, you were ahead of everybody who claims to be a fantasy football expert. So that's why I love that you there was there was only one guru and that's John Hansen. But I'm ter- when did we first kind of meet? How did we get to talking about Alt Nation and Sirius XM and all that? Well, I think you were covering the Packers, and mm-hmm. I'm always I think I was. I mean, I've, I've been I've been friends with Rob Domofsky forever, but I think maybe for the the radio, I, I try to you know get a, relationships with a couple of different people. And I think we reached out to you one time to come on the show. And I'm like, I like this from popping on. Yeah. 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 I'm like, Oh, I like this dude. You know, I follow you on Twitter and I'm like, very like-minded. So yeah, we met, hung out, had some beers. We've had beers and uh, nothing hardcore, you know, out till three, four in the morning. I don't know if you do that at the combine. But uh, not anymore. Yeah. Not anymore. I feel like an old man in Indy. These it's like eleven o'clock, and everybody's just going to Prime Forty Seven and Kilroy's, exactly. and I'm ready to like you know get sleep because I'm away from the kids for a couple of days. <laughs> I mean, I was doing that with multiple kids when I was about uh, you know late forties. I, I lasted up until about fifty. I just turned fifty five, man. Uh, this three days ago four days ago so wow. it's Happy birthday that is weird that is weird i was 26 when i started in this business now 55 all right so let's start at the start like how did you get into fantasy football first i don't really know and then how did you kind of turn it into a business when did the, the, those light bulbs really go off in your head oh um very i can i could give you the bare bones minimum you know, I started playing in 80. Um, I was just finished. I do have a four year degree in communications, you know, uh, radio, TV, film, which is like the only way I was going to go to college is if I could major in something interesting to me like that. So I did get a four year degree with, from a school that I know you're a big um, fan of. Uh, oh, boy. Jim Croce. Right. So I went to the same college as a couple of people in his band that I was telling you about uh, Rowan University, it's now called. Um, but back then it was Glassboro State. Uh, P- Patty Smith uh, also went there. Anyway, long story. Um, but, you know, so I, I was always a sports guy. I always wanted to be into that. But, you know, that wasn't necessarily, you know, where I was at. I finished college. I oh, owned a pizzeria when I was in college. So I was a part owner of a pizzeria working through college. So I'm always been hustling. I was a DJ as well. So I've always been a hustler. Um, I got married young. My, uh, we had a child and, and I had to support that child. My wife was finishing up college. I'm just looking for like a, almost like a, you know, like a side job, a side gig. And I was working in radio and there was a building we rented space out to a TV station. And the guy was doing his TV show it was bad shows, terrible. And I said, well, you should have me on your show. <laughs> Uh, to talk fantasy football, 1994. I said, you know, I said, I, not for nothing, but they, they do kind of call me the guru in my league. Like I make all these unbelievable picks. And so he's like, oh yeah, sure. I did. And that kind of, it kind of like, even in 94, we were getting a lot of calls and it was like a lot of interest. So, so much so that I decided, you know what, I'm going to put, start up a little newsletter, snail mail, mail out, you know, preseason picks and tips and in season and, you know, market it on the show, you know, maybe I can make like an extra 10 grand a year hustling as usual, which is exactly what I did. And then it just kind of put up a website in 1995 and ESPN found me because there was like no one else basically. And they were like, we, we need content. I'm like, I'm your, I'm your guy. So that was 1996 that, that, that happened. And I think that really, I just got involved in anything I could. And it could just kind of snowball from there. I live in a good area. I live 10 minutes from NFL films in South Jersey. I can be in New York like that. I can be in Philly, of course, real quick. So that, that was, you know, part of it, but yeah, I mean, I just tried to take advantage of every opportunity that I could. And it was just one of those things where I was pretty good at it and it was just a, a rocket ship going up anyway. So like, I just, I turned down stuff because it was just so many opportunities. I kept trying to talk to people in uh, Sweden to get cloned, but I, I never heard back. 
you, you, I mean, you're the Mel Kuyper of fantasy football. You recognized a market, the interest, you knew it was just going to explode and only go one direction and got in. But also I think people like your, your viewers, your listeners, your readers are smart. So they're probably keeping a mental log of your, your opinions and your takes on things. And so, I mean, you're, it's not like you just, you know, had this great idea and, you know, you're spewing into right. the atmosphere. I mean, you're doing your work <laughs> and you're developing instincts oh, when sure. it comes to fantasy football. hundred percent. And when you have that baseline, it, it really is, uh, it, it, it accumulates. It's a, there's a cumulative effect when you've been basically like one of the, I don't, I'm, I don't know what the phrase is, but it was basically like, you should listen to your elders, not because they're smarter than you, but they have more experience than you being wrong. And it applies to this. Like I have a lot of experience being wrong and I don't like to be wrong. So I, I do whatever it takes to be right. Basically. I just want the answers to the test. I don't care how I get it. I just want to be correct. But one thing that's been absolutely fascinating to me, which I did not even think about in the early years, I was just spitballing going off of my instincts because I was, I was the guy, like I could see three plays and that guy's a baller. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, I, some people can make fun of me about that, but I've actually did that with a couple of guys, you know? So early on, I was just firing just off the cuff, not off the cuff, but with no fear uh, because, oh, oh, if I'm wrong, who cares? But then I noticed as I start gaining a following, I'm like, oh boy, I don't want to go, you know, too crazy here. And I did get a little conservative for a pretty long damn time. But the beauty of getting old is I don't care anymore. I, I'm, I, I want to be right more than ever, but I don't care about being wrong. And ironically, that is not on a tap, uh, like an old dynamic that I had where again, no, no paralysis by an over analysis, um, being very decisive. You know, Kaplan always tells me that, you know, I should have been a scout because you have to be decisive. And, you know, I, I'm more that than ever. And it is ironic that, you know, it, it took me going into, I don't want to say DGAF mode, but kind of DGAF mode in that I do not care if I'm wrong. I love it. I mean, it really is scouting. I, I have the same approach to, yeah. to fantasy. I mean, doing it my whole life. And I have I don't know. I used to win a lot more than I do now. I'm kind of in a cold streak, so I probably need your help. Uh, uh, but it is like just watching with your own eyeballs. If a dude looks good to you, jot his name down. Watch him. Draft him. Believe in him. Right? Like, don't get caught up into the group think. And, I mean, everybody yeah, has their own yeah. strategy, but, I am, but it's kind of seems. Oh, sure. Absolutely. That's a huge part of it. But I'm I'm a little different than your average uh, fantasy analyst. What, what's ironic is, you know, if I really had to be called on the carpet those first years, those early years to back up my claims, ew, it may not have gone that well. Now, I ended up being correct. But nowadays, you can't get away with that. So I mean, over the last 15 years, 20 years, I've had to really learn a lot of things just to I mean, just to not look like a, almost like a fraud, because ultimately I have like this weird ability to kind of take in just a lot of different pieces of information and kind of bring it all in to make a, a very informed conclusion. Basically, it's like a it's like a freaking algorithm, basically. And, and scouting is obviously a big part of that. But it's not just that. That's why I like to meet a lot of these guys at the combine. You get a feel for them. You know, I'll give you the great example. Um, I've been the biggest Sky Moore stan uh, in the industry, bar none. He came on the show on Sirius XM and was literally one of the best interviews we ever did. The kid was unbelievable. All his answers were great. I'm like, I love this guy, right? Well, it didn't work out that well this year. So, But this year, I'm just, I am all in and... I don't care if I'm wrong, by the way. And it's it's absolutely going to hit. I mean, this guy just got this vibe on this kid, and it's it's happening, by the way. He's been one of their best players in camp. Tony's already hurt. I mean, this this kid's going to be a star uh, this year, and I don't care. I'll say it again. I don't care if I'm wrong. Love it. Well, we're going to open it up. You know, these Zoom happy hours, it's just kind of a free-for-all folks just uh asking questions including admin my dog over my shoulder but why don't you start there who are your 
you probably get asked this every freaking day of your life, but give us a few sleepers right now that are intriguing to you with drafts around the corner. Well, sleep. I mean, what what's your definition of a sleeper? I'll okay, give you a su- guy. Let's I know go you're super gra- sleeper, deep. How about, how about deep. is James Cook a sleeper, or is he almost too obvious? He's about he might, an eighth let's go, round. Let's go pick. even deeper. Yeah, let's go deeper. Okay. All right. Uh, let's take a look. What position do you want? Running backs, care? baby. They're in the news. All right, running backs. All right, let's take a look. Well. Uh, I mean, my long-term guy is Tajay Spears, but that's a little bit of a moot point for this year with uh, with Derrick Henry. Um, sleepers, I'm, I'm, uh, Khalil Herbert, is that a sleeper? Because his ADP right now is, he's like a ninth-round pick, tenth-round pick. And when you really look at uh, everything there in Chicago, um, I actually did a video on this, so it's fresh on the brain. But Khalil Herbert is averaging what's it? I think it's over. It's over five yards a carry. The guy's been good wherever he goes. You know, whenever he gets the ball, he's he's effective. They let David Montgomery go. The current regime, uh, they did draft him, uh, so that's good. Yeah, they let David Montgomery go. They didn't draft him. They brought in Deontay Foreman, okay, and they also drafted Roshan Johnson, who I like. But uh, Roshan just a rookie. Uh, not overly talented, but but good. Deontay Foreman is like game script dependent. You know, like they want to bang it inside for sure. I'm I know that, but you know Herbert, I think is going to be a guy who can get like maybe you know he'll be like the the primary back, but you know he won't get 20 carries, but like 13, 14 a game, one or two catches, pretty pretty darn sneaky. And I went back and I looked because I don't think the Bears defense is going to be very good. I think it'll be playing from behind a lot. So with our fantasy points data suite, I know I'm going to get some plugs in for that that we just launched. I'm able to go and see among all backs, carries or more. What was what were their numbers playing from behind? And it was like 48 running backs, and I mean he came he graded out top 20 uh, more more often than not. So. There's a good one. Uh, he's he's a good player. Real uh, Chase Brown. If you want to go sleeper, real yes. good back. He is a great kid. I, I sat down with him. Unbelievable guy. Uh, jacked up like you couldn't believe. But he moves well. I watched him for a week at the Senior Bowl. I think he's going to get a uh, hundred or more carries alongside Mixon. I think he's clearly going to be the two. Trayvon Williams, by the way, already hurt. And if Joe Mixon goes down, Chase Brown's going to be the guy. And everybody is going to want him. Uh, you can say the same thing about Jerome Ford. Um, I do like David Montgomery as a, a good value this year. Um, moving down here, uh, Cam Akers I'm into, but I do worry a little bit about the Rams being bad. Um, not into the Saints guys this year. Obviously, I love Brees Hall, but we'll see about the injury. I'm looking at a bounce back for Najee. Um, I'm not a fan of, I'm not a big Ken Walker guy. We can talk about that. Uh, and then of course my number one guy that has been this way from day one, I guess he is a sleeper is Rashad white. That's my guy. I mean, he is going to crush it this year in terms of ROI when you can get him in the seventh round and he's going to get 290 touches or more. Rashad white friend of the go long program. Love it. Great. Is he is he the greatest dude of all time or what? Oh. Like, he's great, man. Yeah, I always hesitate to to like go down that road because we like we never really know these players as people. Hanging out with Rashad White for the story we did last year, I remember leaving that his place. But the, the, he is the greatest dude on the planet. Exactly, he's genuine, yeah. like a big genuine heart. You can just tell. Yeah. Yeah. One of the least entitled guys paid his way through junior college. Oh yeah. Um, Living with the cockroaches. It's not absolutely great. Great dude. No, I saw him for a week at the senior bowl. I'm like, man, I like this guy a lot. He's old school too. I, you know, he's like a gigantic Austin Eckler. You know what I mean? His hands are unbelievable. I, I mean, they are literally some of the best hands I've ever seen on a running back. I, I that might sound a little hyperbolic, but man, he can, he can catch a ball. For what it's worth, I was just talking to Chris Godwin on the phone and talked to Rashad White again a couple weeks ago, and they are going to run the ball. Like, they will be committed to running it. Like, they just know it was pathetic last year, and they need balance. They need something, and he's going to be central to everything. So I love Godwin. I, I have never met him, but I love that dude. He is awesome. 
the year he broke out, I called him God Chris Win. I mean, because I'm like, this get him basically. And he crushed it that year. It was 2019, I think. AVM uh on, on the call, and feel free to uh you know shout, scream, anything you guys want here. Ask, do you think a system can make a player? And if so, which guys come to mind that might benefit most this year? That's a good question. How about Justin Herbert? When you look at what Joe Lombardi did last year, I mean, Herbert was arguably, if you exclude dudes who got hurt, I mean, he was like the biggest buzzkill of the year last year. And, you know, Joe Lombardi, no offense. I know it's Vince Lombardi's grandson. That's kind of weird, but, you know, he he really hurt uh, Justin Herbert. I know that they had O-line problems and some protection issues and they did lose some guys and they didn't have a lot of speed, but I mean, his a dot was really bad. You know, uh, everything was very compressed. Uh, so Justin Herbert will have a bounce back, uh, because of a better scheme. uh, I would say, um, you look at Anthony Richardson. I think he landed in the ideal spot with Shane Steichen, given what Steichen did. So, you know, I guess, Ty, what, what is it? Is it scheme, coach, slash play caller? Can we separate those two or is it all that part of it? And that's the uh, the chicken or the egg question that I feel we'll be trying to solve to the end of time, right? Like, I hate it when yeah. we just say, oh, the like San Francisco is a great example. Like, it, it's gotten to the point with Shanahan guys where, oh, he is true, just, true. you know, a Corleone high above as a puppeteer. Yeah. I, these guys deserve credit. Like, the players deserve some credit. If if Shanahan was, you know, that, that Midas touch of a coach, I mean, Trey Lance wouldn't be this great unknown at this point still. So, I don't know. I, I, I think players pl- play at the end of the day. Yeah. How about Tua? That, that That's a pretty good example because Tua was, you would, you could argue unlocked by Mike McDaniel and that offense, like, you know, timing base, you know, five step drop ball out run after the catch. I mean, it was almost indefensible there. So like, if you could, if you could break down the healthy Tua games, I think that was a an example of, you know, system making the player because it was an yeah. ideal system, you know, run after the catch, you know. So and then there, speaking of the Chargers, example. right? Brandon Staley unleashes a different look. He really wasn't prepared. Tua, Mike McDaniel, everybody, and they never really adjusted. So I think that's a big question this offseason. What is the counterpunch in Miami? Because you know everybody's watching that Chargers film and they're they're gonna try to confuse Tua take him off, you know, force him to get to a second read. Well, I think they, they, they should be in the business of acquiring a, a better running back. I mean, I, I said that last year, I was like, we really going into the season with Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert. All right. And Chase Edmonds, who I wasn't a fan of. All right. You know, I mean, they got through it, but that would probably help to have a more effective running game and maybe better, a little more talent. You know, obviously Dalvin Cook. I mean, when Jonathan Taylor came out, I was screaming that Miami should have taken him. I, I know why they didn't because they were rebuilding. But you, you think in retrospect, they'd rather have Johnny Taylor or Austin Jackson right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick, Guru, um, does Aaron Rodgers have anything left in the tank? Because this is Ty's podcast and so you can't go too far without mentioning him but and then second for tyler um how hypocritical is it of or hypocritical is it of aaron Rodgers, who has never defended a coach and not thrown a coach under the bus all of a sudden having nate hackett's back who was terrible last year do you want me to jump in first john yeah you can go first Uh, i i'd love to hear your thoughts on uh mr hackett there (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. All right. So, and you probably know him, right? You're probably friends with him, right? I like Nathaniel Hackett. I really do. Yeah. First met him. Actually, you know what? He was at Syracuse when I was at Syracuse at the Daily Orange. Mm. Never interviewed him. Uh, I covered the football team, Doug Marone's first year with Connor Orr, Maddie Halt. And Connor really got to know Nathaniel Hackett well then and, and beyond. Mm. I think even now at SI. He knows Hackett well. We've had him on to talk about the Jets' offense. Uh, 
And then I, I, I did get to know him in Jacksonville. I think I did a Blake Bortles story at Bleacher Report at one point. I'm like, this guy is energetic. He's got me ready to run yeah, through yeah. a wall. He makes football fun, all that stuff. But yeah. I, at, at the end well, of the life. day, like we can't get caught up into he's a nice guy. Like that, that was, yeah. as Sean Payton perfectly put, one of the worst coaching performances in NFL history. I went back it this was. morning, was just looking at it for the story we have up now. And I mean, holy hell, there's so much I forgot about. Like that Seattle yeah. game and then the Houston game. Remember that sequence, the tight end reverse, and then sending McManus out late. And then the delay game and then the punt. It, it look, I, I don't know. I, maybe there is a code mm. and I'm naive, but I just was really blown away that he took himself that serious and was, you know, he, he if you're if you're Nathaniel Hackett, stand there at the podium and just say, you know what? Sean's right. I was shit. Our offense was shit. Hell, you can even have some fun with it. I'm lucky to have a job right now. Good thing I know Aaron right, Rodgers, yeah. but we play in week five and we're going to find out in week five. So let's go. Or yeah, you know what? Yeah. Sprinkle in a little bounty gate stuff. <laughs> you can, There's so many directions he could have taken it different than the code. Oh my God, the code. T- take my house, but not uh, the code. Um, I don't know. I thought it was amateur hour and okay. it's look. he's been in the NFL now for 11, 12 years. Everybody loves him. Kevin Cobb. When he, when we, that story, he, he was saying when he had that fourth concussion, was blown away by how great Hackett uh, dealt with everything in, in that difficult time. But right. uh, I don't know how good of a coach he is. I really don't. Well, I, don't, I mean, what, he, you know, he's going to let you know Rodgers what do whatever he wants, which is what Rodgers likes. Yeah, well, that's probably what it is. But what I said after that week one debacle, yeah. when, when that Thursday night, was that Thursday night football? I can't remember. But it was a Monday night. Monday night. Monday, I knew it was right. a nationally televised yeah. game. What I said was, whoa, whoa, whoa. You prepared for seven months for that. <laughs> you seven months for that? I, I, that just, I still, that was it. It was over before it began, as far as I was concerned after that. It was so sad. I mean, I really was all in on the Broncos, like a lot of people. Hackett, Russell Wilson, two people who eat, sleep, breathe, shit football. Like, put their minds together. They're going to figure everything out. Like in, yeah. they'll be innovative. It was as boring and dull of an NFL offense. I mean, think about it. Every rule is catered to the offense. It's like these 32 owners are conspiring for every game to be a shootout. And they averaged, I think, 16 points a game. They were 20% third down um, out of the bye week. You know, a bye week is a time when you figure everything out. I think they scored three touchdowns in their next four games. Yeah, I'm I'm out on Nathaniel Hackett. I, and look, Russell Wilson. How do you is not how do you not how, how blame, do you not you know, associate? Blameless. Right, exactly though. But how do you not associate your offense to Russell Wilson's game and think that that's going to work? Too. Yeah. You know, yeah. like he was a bad fit for the offense. I luckily, of course, was out on on the Denver passing attack. Even my guy, Jerry Judy, who I love because I, I thought Russell, I called him a declining player. And I said, well, nope, we've seen the best of Russ. Goodbye. Uh, I did, though, love Javante Williams. And my theory called it a, a conspiracy theory or a reach. But the weird usage does not help a running back get into a rhythm when you're always worried about getting pulled out for freaking Melvin Gordon, when you're Javante Dan Williams, who's one of the most talented guys in the league, yeah, maybe you're pressing a little bit. Maybe you're just not comfortable. You don't get enough of the work to get into the rhythm. And then, oh, look, you tore your ACL. I, I know that's it's a little bit of a stretch, but it might not be. I'm weird. Still Sometimes cool injuries like that aren't, aren't coincidental. Good point. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, and Vic Fangio did the same thing to him. So, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and had that, you know, everyone was worried about Melvin Gordon. I said, I'm not worried. About, like these guys, they get worse when they get older. Hello, you know. Right, Dalvin Cook is not going to turn the New York Jets into Super Bowl contenders. He, he's, I don't know if he's cooked, but right, every metric, right. and I'm not even a metric guy, but man, when you look at what is it rushing yards over expected the last three years it has been as steep of a decline as you can imagine and maybe this is a good opportunity for you to kind of get into what you do now john with 
with your website. So that's it's exactly beyond PFF. that's exactly that's exactly where I was going with this because let's talk a little uh, Alvin Kamara because that's obviously a very um, interesting name. We're waiting on the suspension, uh, but over at the Fantasy Points Data Suite, so we've got unbelievable filtering. So, so I can just do very basic filtering of all hundred carries is usually a good number. Like of all running backs last year with a hundred carries, uh, we can do so much more with, than this, but um, let's take a look. So it was 42 running backs. Let's see where Alvin Kamara rated. And of course at fantasy points data, we charted the last two years completely manually. Um, I don't know how many times we look at each play. It's a lot. Um, and we have our own proprietary data. We have our own stats. So um, explosive run percentage led by Brett Whitefield, formerly of PFF. Um, explosive run percentage. So the percentage of his carries uh, that went for 15 or more yards. Kamara out of 41 running backs last year was 37th. Um, then we have, let's see, missed tackles forced per attempt which is a very important metric again out of 42 running backs uh where was camara uh 23rd which is mediocre um yards after contact per attempt out of 42 running backs alvin camara and by the way uh the eyeball test you know for me said this 32nd out of 42. So I, I, I you see what I'm saying here. Uh, you, you know, all the metrics, these are pretty advanced uh, data points here. None of them good on Alvin Kamara, which matches my eyeball test. And he's now in the worst committee situation that he's been in, in a half a decade. You know, Br Drew Brees put the, the the uh, the icing on the cake for Kamara. He was always going to be great, but with Breeze, now you're you're elevated, catching more passes. So that's gone. Peyton's been gone. So I mean, some people are like, "Oh, look at look at this! You can get Alvin Kamara in the ninth round." I'm like, "Well, you know, I I can get you know a lot of bad movies in the dollar basement, but it doesn't mean it's a good purchase." <laughs> is, is Joe Mixon in it in that same ballpark as Kamara? Uh, yeah, he kind of is. Um, let's take a look in that same sample size, 42 running backs. I think he was even worse in a couple. Oh yeah. 36 in explosive run percent. Now that's only one metric. You know, my guy, LaDainian Tomlinson always told me the first two things to go explosive runs and uh, contact balance. Um, but let's take a look at uh, missed tackles forced per attempt out of 42 running backs joe mixon was dead last out of 42 running backs with 100 carries last year in the national football league that is not good um yards after contact per attempt joe mixon 42 running backs 33rd so when you when you see an eyeball test where eh, it's not quite as good and the data point matches well, you know, you know, my father taught me, you know, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, probably a duck, you know. So, so no. So you don't come up as totally negative. Who is the guys that were at the top of those kids? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Hey, I'm just <laughs> reporting stats. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> spitting cold hard facts right here. Um, I, I love it. I, I just shit on metrics all the time, but we we're we're looking at the metrics <laughs> because we have to. We have to. Well, it matters. Ty, Ty, Ty. I, I'm not. I'm not really a numbers guy myself, but what I always find is is my thinking is always in line with the nerds. So I'm yeah. like, okay, well. But when you I break down well. what the metric is, I mean, it really, like you said, it is. Right. It lines up with your eyeballs. Yeah. Exactly. That's the beauty of this data tool, by the way. Uh, so Dave uh, Montgomery uh, led the NFL in missed tackles forced per attempt. Now, you could argue, oh, well, he was behind a shitty O line. So there were a lot of tacklers to elude, but maybe that's there's maybe some truth to that. But that he's also very good at that. And it will be blocked up a little bit better this year in Detroit. Nick Chubb was number two. Uh, the aforementioned Khalil Herbert was number three. Ramondre was four. 
Uh, your guy, Aaron Jones, was five. Miles Sanders, six. Um, Ken Walker's up there. Um, Got to get Cordaro in there because he's Cordaro. Like, he's just defies logic. Um, there's Dalvin at uh, 14. So um, that's just one metric, but that's a pretty good one. Missed tackles forced uh, per attempt. We also have yards before contact, which is really – Oftentimes, the function of the O line, of course, Miles Sanders led all running backs there behind Philly's O line. Which, by the way, we can you can marry data points and say, okay, Rashad Penny was like way up there, like one in explosive run rate, but you know, pretty poor in yards before contact. Okay, now he goes to Philadelphia, where Miles Sanders led the NFL in yards before, before contact. So if Rashad Penny is going to be in that environment well maybe he might go off until he gets hurt of course love so real quick from a, a drafting standpoint i you i was all on board with your elite eight receivers last year and i took um chase in the first round got aj brown in the third and then of course i panicked because I, I have to have a qb sooner than later how do you break that habit of dependency on wanting a qb i got like hurts in the fourth round and it worked out great but is that too early to be even be looking at QBs or should you wait longer? Well, the top guys are getting more love than, than normal. Um, we've got three guys in the top 30 overall. That, that's just too much for me. Burrow was my guy last year and he was the, he was like a seventh round pick. Now it's going to probably cost you a fourth. He's the first guy that I would take if I was stuck in the fourth and I'm like, I don't like the running backs or wide receivers. I don't like anyone. So what the hell? I'll take Burrow. Of course, his calf injury is something. Uh, Lamar, I'm not big on that big on the cheat code quarterbacks when they're this pricey. So I, I just have my targets, and you know, ideally, get the you know. That's why Burrow was so appealing last year. It's like I had him at QB four. The ADP was QB seven. Well, he was QB four because he had 40 touchdowns. So I got 40 touchdowns at a seventh round pick, but now he's a fourth round pick. So it's not as appealing. So I think Trevor Lawrence is very similar to that. And Justin Herbert will, will drop a little bit, but I think my, my best guy, and this is why you should hold off because there are a number of really good options around 50 and uh, between 50 and 90 Burrow, Lawrence, Herbert, and then my actual favorite ROI guy is Deshaun Watson. Uh, it's a little bit of a leap of faith, but he's also, you know, you guy can get, you might be able to get him in the eighth round. And, and by then, like all the great running backs are gone. All the great, all the great non quarterbacks are already gone. So if you can get them at that point of the draft, that means you, you have a good chance of winning the draft. If Watson is anything close to what he was in 2020. Man, that was great. Uh, so we, we've got a couple questions here. AVM says he's been checking out your site, says it looks interesting, and he was wondering if you could give a quick rundown on how it differs from other sites, and he asked if you're using AI. No, we're, we're not using any AI now. We'd, I'd like to use AI in lieu of programmers. Can we do that? Because those dudes are expensive, <laughs> uh, first and foremost. Um, but, well... You know, as we've discussed, we we are, you know, we've been kind of uh, the same as most other sites, basically just football and slash fantasy analysts and, you know, stat analysts and the like. I'm a little bit more on the scouting side of things. And, you know, I'm a little bit more, you know, I've been around a long time. So I've got you know, a lot of connections. So we get inside type of information that we you know, pump into our stuff and, you know, scouting, not just fantasy nerds, but we also have the, the data suite now, which is we literally have our own stats that are actionable and, you know, will, it will help your, your draft for sure, but it's probably a little bit more um, valuable in season for weekly lineup decisions and, and really betting uh, gambling. Ty, how about uh, this stat? which didn't exist until we just unveiled this uh, a week ago uh, on the interwebs. 
first read target share. So you want to know how often your receiver is the first read for the quarterback. I mean, what is cooler than that? You know, so let's take a look it's amazing. at some of the leaders. It really here. is. So take a guess. Who do you think was the leader with 38.5% of his team's first read targets? Tyreek Hill. Devontae Adams. He was fourth. Devontae Adams. Yep. Cooper Cup was was third or second. Uh, Jamar Chase was third. Stephon Diggs, C.D. Lamb, Amon Ra. Ironically, Justin Jefferson was only eighth. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, Garrett Wilson checks in as a rookie at 10. A.J. Brown. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Drake London was pretty high up on that list. Uh, and then you could do all kinds of sorting and rain. Uh, you know, you can you can you can real literally look in season and say, okay, uh, who leads the league in target share? First read target share percentage in November in divisional road games when it's less than forty degrees. Boom, we can do it. <laughs> I mean, you, you have scouts watching film and looking at these quarterbacks and seeing where they're looking. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we may Larry have tell that. Him how to do his job. Well, we may have, <laughs> which actually, this isn't really my job. Uh, I'm not the data scientist. <laughs> I'm a C math student. Okay. Uh, the, we may have the first read. Uh, let's take a look. Completion percentage. Probably not, but you know, considering the stat didn't exist two, two weeks ago, uh, that's right. That's, that's pretty good. I love it. I love it. I think we had another question in here from Colin. If you're still hanging on the zoom, Colin, feel free to just chime in because Lord knows everybody's heard my voice enough. He's gone. All right. Colin asked, what do you think about the Ravens and the chiefs running back committees? Who are the ones to prefer from those teams? Well, start with KC. Um, they haven't really done anything else here. Although Daenerys Prince, uh, the undrafted kid out of Tulsa, is opening up some eyes. I mean, it wouldn't be a, a stunner if they bumped Clyde Edwards-Alaire off the roster, but I think they're simply going to replicate last year with probably a little bit more for Pacheco. And Jarek McKinnon will be that you know, receiving back, you know, the, uh, the guy, the light box guy, you know, where you give him a couple, you know, four handoffs a game, five handoffs a game uh, in this pass happy offense. And then Pacheco would be, you know, your downhill bruiser, your closer. Uh, so I think that's fairly clear. And then the, what was the other one again? Jeez. I already forgot that quickly. Ravens. Oh, Baltimore, Baltimore. Yeah. Ravens. Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, it, it all it all comes down to J.K. Dobbins because you know he's the guy, but he's got to be in there practicing and healthy. Is he holding in? Is he holding out? Is he upset that I, I don't know what what he thinks he can you know if he has a leg to stand on here? Like so you got to get out of a rookie contract it, it, or not get hurt. You know what I mean? Like okay, maybe if you go off, they're going to resign for three, two three years. Okay, but he's been hurt, so I mean. I don't blame the Ravens for waiting to see what he does this year. Uh, all the data points, by the way, we had on him once we got to a certain point were actually outstanding, but who knows? I mean, this is the weird recovery. Maybe there's been some sort of setback, but they, they've done very little here uh, next to nothing other than Melvin Gordon, which might actually be nothing. So I think we're looking at Gus Edwards and Justice Hill, who was worked in a little bit more. Of course, it is a new office coordinator, but you know, it, to me, it's kind of, Dobbins or probably an ugly committee. Bring Le'Veon Bell. That we don't want to that carries. we don't want a part of, by the way. What was that, Ty? Bring Le'Veon Bell back for five carries. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. That was sad. So what do you think of the like the Chargers in general with um like the receiving core and they're always hurt? And they're kind of aging. Would you like invest in them or are you mm. steering clear? I'm actually steering clear. Um, Quentin Johnston, 
I didn't think he was like a slam dunk prospect. I know there's a lot to work with physically and all that. Uh, deepest voice since God, uh, by the way. I don't know if you guys have heard him uh, speak, but uh, um, I've not not been a big Mike Williams guy. He's a little bit of a one trick pony. He gets hurt a lot. Keenan Allen, you know, we've hit that year. I mean, I actually wrote last year about year 29 being going into last year. I remember writing like year 29 scares me because I looked the year before in 2021, the only top 12 receiver 29 or older was Keenan Allen. And then of course he turned 30. Uh, and then what, what happened? Uh, the wheels a little bit fell off. So I am not going to take him. I, I tend to take ascending players and I'll quit a year too early. Uh, I'd rather do that. I don't really like Gerald Everett either. So I honestly don't really like any of the charger receivers. I almost don't like any of them. Um, Eckler of course has been great, but uh, you do worry about his advanced stage. Although I guess if, at this point, if anybody can do it, it's him because he is, um, he's a guy that I did not get right. He's a guy that I was skeptical on for a number of years. And my, my explanation is very simple. There's, there hasn't been anyone like him for 30 plus years. That's why I was wrong because I was skeptical that he could do it, but he's the ultimate outlier. And Derek Henry's kind of similar. Like I hated Henry, you know, so I was, I was right for two and a half years. And I was very, very wrong. Why ultimate outlier. One, two, three, give us your first three picks, regardless of format. How should it go down? I'm going to go wide receiver heavy this year, and I'm going to go Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, and then Tyree Kill. Chase money in the back. first. Yup, yup. I'm feeling it. Last year I was. Last year everyone was cut. Because he's the same exact profile of Jefferson, um, with a better quarterback because he's. Entering year three at 23 years old after balling the F out for two years and probably ready to really, truly get ready to earn that big uh, first contract or second contract. So I need to selfishly you ask you a question, big, though, too. Although, Don, you go oh, first. Go ahead. You go, Don. No, go. So who, who do you think are going to be the biggest bust at each like, of the three major positions? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, well, how about Justin Fields at quarterback? Because, look, if he suits up, he's going to be fine because he's likely going to be running around 13 times a game. But my argument would be if he does, he's going to get the crap beaten out of him like he did last year. And he's going to be more prone to injury than most quarterbacks. Because I had a conversation with this about, about this with Rich Gannon about three weeks ago. Obviously, Rich won the MVP at quarterback. And was a running quarterback. He not not to this level, but very athletic. He was drafted as a defensive back, actually. Um, and he said, absolutely a residual effect. Why do you think Lamar Jackson is starting to break down a little bit? Let's let's be fair. And Hurts, you know, that's why it's like Hurts for the fantasy playoffs last year in the semis in the championship got you a zero. I mean, that's a little, and you're really gonna take that guy in the second round? Uh, good luck. So, you know, I'm going to go there and then, you know, cheat code type of guys um, or, or the easy pickings. Cause last year I was down on Kyler and Lamar. And they, they were out, but the running backs, I just go old. I, I'm a major ageist. So uh, let's see who, who are the old guys? Derrick Henry. I, I don't buy. They can hold up all year. Mixon. I'm not that into him. Uh, ETN is not old, but. I wasn't very impressed by him last year. I, I, Alexander Madison is going to be fine. I, I, he's just so boring. I'm I'm not a fan. Um, That's not your Vikings uh, bias. No, 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 not really. No, I, I usually <laughs> no. I get the Viking guys right because I mean we're good at fantasy. I mean, Lord knows we're never winning a real championship. We got to win a fake one. So, I mean, I get I get the Viking guys right way often uh, more often. Uh, by the way, Jordan Addison is going to is a good a good pick, very good pick. Every year, I go running back, running back, running back, and for the longest time, it was a great strategy because you know they just 
fly off the board. Is it time for me to get up with uh, the times and, and stop doing that? Because it's, it's I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a source of mockery from actually somebody who listens to you every second of every day, Ted Costenis, if you're listening to this podcast. Uh, Teddy C, hey, Ted. the legend. He's basically the Bill Belichick of our fantasy league. Our fantasy league, it's a ton of family members, dads, brothers, cousins, uncles. And then Teddy C went to high school with my dad, and all he does is kick everybody's ass. You know, he's, uh, he probably has six or seven championships, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm mudging. Does he, does he mumble a lot? He is. No, uh, like yes. That. He, at the draft, he sets up with about three or four laptops, a lot of notebooks, a lot of magazines, a lot of strategy. He's been strategizing. He's probably strategizing right now as we're talking. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, he, rightfully so. He he gives me hell when I go running back, running back, running back. So is that a good strategy this year to be obsessed no. with the backs? Or should yeah. I, you know, maybe think about a wide receiver first round? Yeah, yeah. Go, go, go way more wide receiver heavy. I'll tell you, th- this is a good compromise. Um, go with a running back with one of your first two picks and we'll call him your anchor. Like Saquon in the second would be ideal. Uh, Nick Chubb, if he fell to early second, would be real nice. Maybe even Najee Harris, although you might want to get him in the third, honestly. Um, and then, then you could like chill back for a little while and and accumulate as many high quality wide receivers as you can, because um, they're going off the board earlier and faster than ever, and it's pushing the running backs down a little bit. So. Um, you want to get in the wide receiver business. I would say the ideal start to a draft, honestly, this year, you know, not ideal, many pass to a championship, but really good one would be like three wideouts with your first four picks, honestly, or, or let's say three with your first five picks and it, and only one running back, you know, cause you can get my guy Rashad white in the eighth round and get, you know, others. Uh, so, Get in the wide receiver business. Get that um, that one running back. David Montgomery would be another guy you can get as your RB two in like round seven. That's a good one, um, and I think your friends will will be impressed. They won't break your balls. I, I can tell you that. I love it. So, Chad, do you have a breakdown of what is the prime picking position that leads like to more fantasy championships? Well, I'm actually in the middle of doing a whole exercise where I write an article and I do a podcast slash video on all 12 spots. It's a little redundant, but um, as it stands right now, I do like early in the first. It, it, it can be a little, it's an easy call, obviously with one or two at Chaser Jefferson. And then the way that the board flows, you're going to get access to like a Brees Hall, you know, in round two or three there on the turn. That's pretty nice. You know, char- starting out, uh, Jamar Chase, Brees Hall. That's what I would call terrific. Um, and then you could get another wide out there, most likely. That would be a pretty good start. So I think um, getting Chase to me is like the ideal situation. So when you come back, and if you can maybe Tony Pollard or uh, Brees Hall, I mean, that's nice balance right there. And then um, you can come back after you get that one running back. You don't need to go uh, running back again. And then right before there's a big drop off at wide receiver, you can get another one, or you can even get like uh, maybe maybe want to go tight end Mark Andrews. That's a, it's a pretty good one too. You can go BPA, uh, best player available. I did want to get in before I forget. Uh, probably the biggest thing I got wrong last year. I was, I would say I was I was right, but still wrong was Gabe Davis. Um. And I'm back on board. I had heard from our guy, Adam Kaplan, about this in the season that he had that high ankle sprain from week two. It it affected him all year, as you guys probably know. So they did nothing. He was a winner coming out of the draft. I'm skeptical of Dalton Kincaid. And and lo and behold, I've been saying this for months. Lo and behold, Steph Diggs was calling out a career year today, right, for Gabe Davis? I love Gabe Davis this season. I was so happy to see Buffalo do the right thing and just not throw money at DeAndre Hopkins, right? For for but the, the the fans' sake, there's no need. I, I, if you believe in Gabe Davis, which they say they do, then 
get those targets as direction. And I don't know if the that, that's the question, right? I mean, Don, you're probably watching the Bills as close as anybody, but the drops. How much of the ankle is feeding the drops? At first, I was you know you watch a Bills game and you get frustrated with him, but I I think it was a factor. I do. Like, I think he'll be a good player. Yeah, I agree because a lot of his drops were on comebacks, and that's where you're really putting a lot of pressure on your ankle, and you're coming back, and then he, he's dropping the ball. So, in th- that's just the correlation I saw, you know. And, yeah. and of course, he dropped that one against the Jets on that bomb. But who thinks Josh is going to throw it seventy yards with a hurt elbow as well? Well, I mean, that was bad. He had a game, yeah, that was bad. He had a, he had a game <laughs> taken away from him, right? He had a, a touchdown drop in like the finale at the late in that game. That, that wasn't what you referred yeah, to against against uh, the Patriots. Yeah. So yeah. I had him with 10 touchdowns. Well, he got seven. So he dropped that easy one. Should have eight. Had a game taken away. And he had the high ankle. So when I actually looked at my projection, it is so easy for me to say, well, give him another game and don't have the injury occur and just give him like five more catches for like 90 more yards. Then I nail the projection on the head. So I mean, it's like I got it wrong, but I wasn't that wrong. So I'm right. I'm right back here. This year. By the way, I still believe in everything you had to say, even though I was on the Antonio Gibson train two years ago with you. Yeah, you know what that was? I'll tell you exactly what that was. I mean, by the way, he was the RB10 for the season. So it's like I, I kind of yeah. joked him like, I am so so sorry. For advocating the tenth best running back in fans. That's that's my bad. Uh, but but no, I, I did take on uh responsibility with that. And I it's very simple. A former college receiver who showed some nice burst and natural power and potential the year before as a runner, and now he gets the opportunity. I assumed that he would get better, but his would improve. Didn't happen. So it's one of those, either you have it or you don't. And that's why they drafted Brian Robinson. And that's why the opportunities are so fleeting. He had that one chance to be a lead back and he did not improve enough to preclude them to, you know, draft Brian Robinson. And now he's going to be cast properly as a changeup. But that, that's what happened. We, we assumed just logically that he's learning the position, you know, okay, get better. But sometimes you know, I could study trigonometry for 30 years. I'm still not going to get no crap. You know what I mean? You don't have it in you. You don't have it in you. Hey, you and go along both. I, I hung out with Antonio Gibson ahead of that season for a story, and I was all in, man. Like the the uniqueness to his game, the ubiquitous. You can just throw him anywhere. The way he, he, he processes offensive football, it was different. Maybe it is usage. Maybe it is him. Uh and I, I had the same takeaway, right? We can just still say, hey, look, look at the final numbers. Everything worked out okay. Right. Well, you know, it's a learning experience. Uh, like I said, I got a lot of experience being wrong. So I'm like, my bad, duly noted. I, again, I am so sorry for advocating the RB10. But yeah, no, he, he, did, he, did, he did disappoint. Well, you've That's been awesome. amazing, John. I mean, we have our, our last question here. AVM asks your favorite tight end for a FF. PC draft. Oh yeah, I love tight end position here. I, I, I've always been into that spot. I, if I had made it to the NFL, not that it came remotely close, but that would have been my jam right there. Um, well, I, I, I'm in on pits. I'm in on pits. Yes. I, I was not in last no. year. No. So I mean, that's worth noting. Um, I do like Najoku. Um, you know, I, I like Chiggy, um, but the FFP, the answer to the question is, it's a tough one here. Look, the answer is Darren Waller of healthy, but like, I, I'm not going to back him, but if Darren Waller stays healthy, he's probably going to be the tight end three and kick ass for the giants. As you guys know, um, you know, Evan Ingram, I, really, I, I was completely out on him last year. I was incorrect, uh, but he's looking pretty good. Um, I'll, I'll go Chiggy. I'll still go Chiggy if you're looking for the dirt cheap one. Uh, one, one other thing I want to, I, because I, I know we, we talk Packers a lot too. I know you're a Bills guy too, but um, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about Jordan Love. Um, so 
I think it's going to be slow going, but I really yeah. guys like what Green Bay has done here to surround Jordan Love. I think it's a very safer veteran leadership at receiver and all that, but you know, that's a young group, but I, I really like what they did. I think it's a great environment. What a beautiful note to go on. on. You, you, you know, our audience, Positive. Positive. Mr. Guru. I love it. We are very, very Jordan love friendly at go along. And with that, everybody oh. needs to go to data dot fantasy points.com subscribe 50 bucks. That's it. Well, you can, right? get a, you can get a free trial. You can get a free trial. Free trial. Like a seven day, it's a seven day trial. Go check. I, I dare you <laughs> to check it out because it's uh, it's very badass and you'll and you'll you'll buy. Basically, you'll buy. Hey, you got to spend money to make money, as they say. Right. So eventually you're getting it for free. Eventually pour your money into this and you're going to make thousands of dollars. It's going to be 200 next year, too, by the way. 200. This is 75 percent off for the year one. No, this is legit here. This is what other sites charge NFL teams, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds, probably of thousands of dollars for this data. So, uh, yeah, this is an opportunity to get in on get all up in there and uh, and and use the actionable data uh, to win. Yeah, you're right. Win. It's all about winning. So you can basically be an NFL scout without needing to go to Prime 47 and drink until 5 a.m. You can just get fantasy exactly. points data and, and you're good to go. I mean, I like when you're looking at um, a random Sunday in November, let's say it's raining and your AFC West quarterback is on the road in a road divisional game. Like you can call, you can reverse engineer a guy's actual situation on game day and create data reports to replicate his situation to see, well, you see what you see. That's when you make better decisions on your player props and, and your game bets and all that. Like you, you get what I'm saying there? Like, Russ Wilson's on the road uh, in sub 30 temperatures in November divisional game. Well, what has he done in that environment thus far this year? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's only one or two games, but you, you could call that up and, and reverse engineer a guy's current situation to see the data. AVM says he's sold. He's signing up and I'm going to do the same. You're the man, John, same here. the guru. That was unbelievable. I'm now excited to actually research for my draft, and I'm going to start at Fantasy Point State. So thank you so much for spending Thursday you got it. with us. Happy to be here. Good luck to all your people, and uh, don't be a stranger. And everybody listen, right? Sirius XM, the guru speaks every day. What time do you start in the morning again? Seven, Tyler. Seven. Seven. seven yes. Yeah, I was going to say six. We actually are going. Seven. <laughs> nope. No, no. I was, I was like, nope. Sorry. Uh, couldn't do the six. <laughs> so, John, are you going to be uh, doing fantasy for any uh, TV outlets this year with uh, DirecTV going away as far mm-hmm. as the red zone? Or no. Where, are you no. Be? where can we find you? Fantasypoints.com. So, f- for the first right. time in 15 years, I- I'm not going to be doing some sort of outside media gig uh so yeah i will be doing like uh post inactive vids uh, for subscribers on there like reacting to the inactives which is what i did for 10 years on direct tv uh which unfortunately they lost the ticket oh well you know like i mean it 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 sucked but but you know all good things must come to an end and uh I was getting a little too old to fly out to la uh 18 weekends a year which i did for three years in a row Wow. Well, Scott Hansen, God bless his soul. He Syracuse guy does need some help. So yeah. maybe and no, no relation, by the way, no relation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks so much for hanging out with us, John. That was incredible. Uh, you got it, man. You got take it easy, guys.